Hello, and welcome to the Church Revitalization Podcast, brought to you by the Malfers Group team, where each week we tackle important, actionable topics to help churches thrive. And now, here's your hosts, Scott Ball and AJ Matthew. Well, hi, everybody, and welcome to episode 59 of the Church Revitalization Podcast. AJ Matthew here, along with my buddy, Scott Ball, as usual. How are you doing, Scott? Man, I'm doing so, so good. Well, good. And I'm loving the article you wrote this week, Scott, to hire or not to hire. That is our topic today and three ways to know when to pay the fun subtitle. I want to mention first that this week's episode is brought to you by the First Impressions Conference coming up on November 4th through the 6th right here on the old internet. And uh, if you go and get your ticket for your church, one one um, entrance for all of your staff um, and you put in coupon code Malfers, you're going to get $10 off. So that's going to be great. Three days of content. They've got over a hundred speakers and yours truly and Scott Ball are going to be also bringing you some content on those couple of days. So Scott, um, hiring or not hiring in the church is a big question. I'm, I've been getting this question a bunch. It's one of the reasons why I wanted to write something on this. Um, I think that the the pandemic has caused people to sort of reevaluate personnel. When should we pull the trigger and spend money on on this position, or or should we even spend money on this position? Or what should we do? So I think it's a challenging topic. What should be paid? What should be volunteer? How do we know? Can we create any sort of guiding principles to decide? Does this rise to the level of being something we should pay for? Or is it something we should just use volunteers for? And I think the answer to that, AJ, is yes. Uh, we've developed three guiding principles with a handful of caveats uh, at the end that we'll tackle. So yeah. it, it, as questions come up and we go through these things, if you're thinking, well, wait, what about, what about, we'll, we'll try to address those whatabouts. Um, but generally speaking, three guiding principles to know, should we hire this out or should this be volunteer? Yeah, let's jump into the first principle on uh, knowing when to hire. Well, does the position involve shaping strategy in the church? And this is definitely one of those high-level areas that we've got to maintain good, effective control over. Strategy is developed at the upper levels of the church for the church as a whole. And we've got to be careful then as we look through layers of leadership what layers need to be able to develop maybe some specific strategy in those areas? Um, and where do those layers, how do they fit with the, maybe the next layer up to understand the big picture strategy so that they can make sure that it applies to their ministry effectively? A lot of churches think that 100% of the coaching and uh, volunteer scheduling uh, and all of the delegating of tasks and all of that should be done by staff. Mm-hmm. Um, and the reality is that you can accomplish some of that t- team management through uh, a higher level volunteers, what we would call an L3 leader or a at the leader at the coaching level. And so you can, you can actually empower um, high level volunteers to manage your scheduling for, for different teams, sub teams, um, not, super, super large teams or entire ministries necessarily, but uh, for individual subsections, for example, you can set a uh, a coach or an L3 leader over, uh, say, the, all the preschool classes. So one person is coordinating who's who's going to be in, working in preschool, you know, the first and third Sunday and who's, who's doing second and fourth. And they have a point of contact. And uh, at any rate, so we, we're not going to go into leadership pipeline here and kind of explain all these levels of leaders. But if if the if the position never rises to the point where they have to take on shaping strategy for an entire ministry, it can probably be done by a volunteer. Mm-hmm. I know that that's counterintuitive. A lot of churches, especially larger ones, go, no, we've got to hire the, the, the nursery coordinator. we got to hire the a preschool coordinator. We've got to hire the, uh, and you, no, you probably don't. There are things that can be done that are task delegation, management, volunteer schedule management, coaching, those kinds of things that can be done by high level volunteers. If it, if the role does not involve shaping the strategy for an entire ministry area, 
and what that looks like is going to scale, obviously, depending mm-hmm. on the size of the church and the complexity of your church. But um, then it's not a staff position. It's a volunteer position. And I know yeah. that's counterintuitive, AJ, but it's the reality. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, if you, if you, it, I mean, it, what it does is it changes the function of that staff position. So uh-huh. that staff position now, instead of, you know, being the one doing all the work, they're spending more of their time in getting paid now to, to coach a volunteer team that is getting more done. And it might require right. that you break up job functions into some smaller, slightly smaller bite-sized pieces instead of, you know, this higher level position that might be full time that needs to get paid. I mean, you just take that down a notch and then the person overseeing that is functioning differently. They're, they're managing this volunteer team instead of maybe managing another layer of paid people. Right. So I was having a conversation, I think it was a week or two ago with a pastor who was walking me through, I think it was their children's ministry. They had someone who's doing a a volunteer who is doing a lot of scheduling and, and coaching and all the things that an L3 um, coach level, uh, volunteer would be doing, could be doing, should be doing. And I thought this was good news. And he, and he said, I really think we need to start paying this person because it's kind of a lot of work for them. And I said, well, all right, break down for me all the things that this person is doing and over which areas. And I, and <clears throat> as he was explaining it to me, I realized their problem is not that they need to start paying this person, the, their problem, because that person they're not going to be able to pay that person enough for it to be a full-time job. They're, that's just going to be like a, a little bit of a, uh, a salve over their wound of, of the burnout that they're experiencing, I guess. Um, what they need to do is they need to split that coaching position into more than one coaching. Right. Position. Yep. I want to slip in two more quick points on this. And again, and it would be really easy to, to end up deep diving into leadership. This, pipeline. Could, this could be like a whole episode. Honestly. It could. So, but I do want to mention just a couple things for our listeners, viewers, readers, and that is this does require a couple of principles, some leadership pipeline principles that you do these some prerequisite prerequisite principles. First, clear job descriptions, because if you don't, you got to know what people are, need to be doing in these things to be able to figure out at what point you draw the line on what they're going to do. And the other one is also managing the quantity of people under any other position. So I think those are a couple of important things to keep in mind. And we don't need to go into a lot of detail on that, but we can't assume one person can manage a hundred people unless that hundred person group all have like very, you know, simple things that they're doing. And it's not, you don't have to get into a lot of individual task and handholding, but when, as those go up, that number has got to be smaller and you're going to have to come up with a number in your organization. That's kind of a safe, a safe number that's easy to manage before you start getting into paid positions. So yeah. again, those Eight. two things, good, good job help. descriptions so that the people know what they need to do and their up-level leader needs to know and managing the quantity of people under any other one person. That's right. There's some nuance to this. It kind of depends a little bit, but uh, essentially you're looking for a span of control to be about eight people. Um so any any volunteer coach you have shouldn't have more than eight people beneath them that they have to actively coach. You you can have some exceptions, like you you could have uh, someone who's coordinating the coffee team, and there might be twenty people who help out with coffee, and all that person is doing is managing the 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 volunteer scheduling for twenty people. But there's only maybe two or three in that ministry that he or she has to actively coach, that would be okay. So there's a little bit of nuance to this. Yeah. You know, if you're interested in, if you're going, hold on a minute, you're breaking out your pen and paper and you're trying to take notes on this, you might need a leadership pipeline help. Talk to us. Um, we do this work with churches. So um, if you're interested in that, let us know. But principle number one, staff positions are ones that require shaping strategy for a particular ministry or area. Yep. Very good. Principle number two is that the position would require safeguarding theology. So this is your next thing. If it should be a paid position, if it's at the level in which theology for your church needs to be safeguarded, managed, monitored. Yeah. So this is a little bit tricky, right? Because even your lowest level Sunday school children's teacher is doing theology to some extent, right? Because they're teaching children 
the gospel and the Bible. And so, mm -hmm. you know, if you were to, I think, read too much into this principle, you'd be going, I guess we should be paying all of our, all of our Sunday school teachers. No, that's, and that's not what we mean. You have, you have people who are teaching theology at every level and certainly within volunteers, but the, it's the responsibility of staff to safeguard that theology. So I don't want to, I'm not trying to go on a personal vendetta against right now media. So let me just be clear on that. But what I see a lot, like a lot in churches is that they'll get, you know, a subscription to right now media and then just turn over um, to their small group leaders or Sunday school teachers, let them choose anything on there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just a little bit of analogy here. It would be like, downloading the YouTube kids app on your television or on your phone, handing your, your phone or the remote to your TV, to your kids and saying, watch whatever. I mean, the stuff that's on there is supposed to be safe for kids, but it's not just that it's supposed to be safe from, you know, something that would be truly evil. Right. Um, but you would want to know what your kids are watching because you want to know what's being taught to your kids. Mm -hmm. It might not be something pornographic or sexual, right? But it, it could be something that's teaching your kids not to obey parents or something that is encouraging, I don't know, being obsessed with toys and um, consumerism, right? Like you want to know what your kids are watching. You can't just assume because it's on YouTube kids that it's good. The mm -hmm. same is true with something like Right Now Media, where you go, you can't just assume that everything that's on there is good. Right Now Media is, in, is a business that is wants to have as much content on its platform as possible so that it appears more valuable to their clients. That is not a slam against right now media. And I'm not suggesting there's anything that's outright satanic or wrong or evil on their platform. I'm not saying that, mm -hmm. but chances are there are things on there that don't line up with your church's theology that don't line up with how you would want things taught or presented. And you have the responsibility to, and you're the one as a pastor who's going to be held accountable for what's being taught to your people. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, we've both have had, have worked with churches on numerous occasions in which we found typically at like the Sunday school or small group level, there's, there are no theology safeguards over what's being taught. They, it's what you're, what you're driving at right now, Scott. Um, and yeah, so, I mean, I, I worked with a church and they had a Sunday school person who was, in my opinion, completely off the rails. I mean, really was not in your opinion in, in all orthodox. <laughs> I, was, I think that's, that's in fair all to say. That's proper fair to say. even, I mean, any mainstream, right? Yes. Perspective. If not even just ourselves, evangelical, to be honest. Uh, yeah. If we, we are, details, if we are a Christian faith church and specifically in a, a proclaimed evangelical Christian faith church, we should be teaching um, the word of God rightly. And, you know, exploring other faiths and religions um, as, you know, perhaps as if they are equal to other and, alternatives yeah. to, you know, a route to heaven and relationship with Christ or with God. That's not what we should be teaching in our Baptist yeah. church Sunday school. So the way I view this and the way I presented it to this church was if we say, hey, Sunday school teacher, you can do whatever you want, then we have elevated them to the position of pastor. Because at what point then are they actually different? They've got their own little congregation. They're choosing what they, I guess, what some would say, what God has maybe, you know, given to them as the right word to bring to those people on any particular Sunday morning. And no one else is paying attention to them. How different are they from you're just letting maybe, you know, a church plant use a space in your building? Uh, it's really very little different from that. So right. we've got to take this, this decision-making, this theological decision-making and, and curriculum and teaching up to the level, really at the pastoral level of the church. Why would you not want all of your people learning the same thing at the same time in the right way with the right word choices and, um, you know, knowing that scripture is, is remaining sound and intact um, the way we know it should be taught? You know, even so, even if you're using right now media, again, I'm not trying to slam them, but even if you're using a platform like that, the staff should decide what, what small, what 
from right now media are is being used in small groups. Mm -hmm. um, so even if not everybody's doing the same thing, you could have 10 different groups doing 10 different things, but group leaders shouldn't decide what to yeah. do. It's that's being previewed by staff. So we're making sort of a declarative statement that that should be a staff responsibility. So the, the consequence of that is any role that would require that kind of decision making is probably one that you should hire um, and not just have a volunteer do. Yeah. Should, that's, that's probably what you're going to. So principle one is, is it shaping strategy for a ministry area? Number two, is it sort of shaping the theology or safeguarding the theology of a particular area? Then it's probably a staff position and not a volunteer one. All right. Yep. Number three. Moving on to number three, it uh, should be a paid staff position if there's a management, a significant management of finance in the church. Yep. Um, and so, you know, we're talking about areas in which uh, there needs to be, you know, a pretty high level of accountability um, mm -hmm. and integrity and yep. decision making and how money is spent. This is where we should probably have it up at the staff level. Yeah. So we're not talking about Anybody who spends money has to be a staff person because you could have the youth, a youth volunteer is going to pick up, you know, chips and soda, uh, you know, at the, at the grocery store and needs to get, um, you know, and uses the church credit card maybe, or, you know, gets reimbursed or whatever. We're not talking about that. We're talking about people who are making large scale budgetary decisions and monitoring and managing funds. If it requires that level of, of accountability, it's probably one you want to hire. And the reason is you it's difficult to hold volunteers accountable at that level. You can fire a volunteer. People say you can't fire volunteers. Yeah, you can. You can fire volunteers from, yeah. from what they're doing. But it's difficult to fire a volunteer for, you know, you're, oh, man, you're doing, not doing a good job. Uh, managing this budget. I just don't think this is working out. They, they could rally a coup against you or whatever, or whatever. Versus if you're, if you have a staff person, you have, you just have a lot more buttons and levers you can press in terms of holding them accountable. Mm -hmm. You're going to catch mistakes sooner because you're meeting with them more frequently. You're getting reporting from them more frequently. Um, you can catch them in the hallway. You can pull them into an office and say, hey, we need to talk about this. You just don't have that same degree of accountability and, um, and closeness with, uh, with a volunteer. And so people who are making high-level budget decisions um, and monitoring and spending at high levels should be staff. The exception to this, obviously, is oversight of a budget might be done by a lay board. I'm not talking about oversight. I'm talking about execution and active management of, of a budget. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think I think there's a couple of different ways that people might look at all three of these principles. And and depending on maybe what your angle is, uh, you would go you could, would go one way or the other. One person might be, you know, hearing what we're saying and think, oh, so I, now I need to hire here or hire here or hire here. And the other way to think about this is you might already have enough staff in place. And you just need to reallocate how they spend their time. So maybe they should spend more time on strategy development, theology, and financial oversight and have another layer of volunteers under them that are doing all of the small execution tasks that maybe right. is consuming a lot of their time. Spend so, less time flipping copies. Less right. time. You yep. might be able to just change your job descriptions and functions and elevate these principles up to a staff per person that maybe is already there, create some more volunteer teams underneath them to free them up for spending time on the higher level things that they should be spending their time on now. Yeah. All right. Now let me let me get to some caveats here yeah. to this. Uh, the first one, the first obvious question is about what about support staff or admin positions because they don't really fit those three principles. They're not they're not shaping strategy generally. They are not. Um, you know, safeguarding theology for the most part. They they may have some financial accountability. We'll talk about that in a second. But um, but they're not generally shaping the budgets and, and that kind of thing. Although they may be dealing with money. So as a general rule, I consider administrative staff or support staff as an extension of 
the ministry staff position. So they're parallel. Like when we when we do the leadership pipeline design process and we're working on an org chart, we we don't put admin staff or support staff. Um, we put them parallel to the position that the staff position that they're working with. They don't kind of have their own section within it. So um, for example, the pastor's assistant, um, he or she is going to relieve tasks from the pastor um, that otherwise the pastor would have to do himself or herself. So um, checking email, managing schedule, those kinds of things that can't be delegated to a volunteer in reasonably. They need to be done by the pastor, but because the pastor's time is limited, he needs support or administrative help to take off tasks that he would otherwise have to do. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think this is the great way to think about it. And I think this is maybe a lot of people even listening are going to need to reframe that in their mind as well. And I guess the danger here is that admin people or support people ended up end up a lot of times getting piled on from multiple angles. All right, and they shouldn't. So this is an ad this is I'm advocating that you don't dump on admin people ministry expectations. Um or you need to rework what that person is doing so that they are a ministry staff person. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you could have yeah. you, you could have create a sort of a new whole wing so to speak on your on your pipeline that's operations and they are making ministry type decisions ministry altering effective decisions and reorganize some of your admin staff under an operations wing you could do that um but if the person is a you know they work the front desk like don't pile on a bunch of ministry expectations on that person it's not fair yeah i've seen that a lot <laughs> i've seen that happen a bunch so um the first question then is about admin positions. The, the other thing, I think the other reasonable sort of objection to the um, principles we've laid out, because we're obviously advocating at a high level for there to be more volunteer engagement and that more things can be done by a volunteer than you generally assume can be done by a volunteer. But it's very possible that you don't have volunteers in your um, church particularly if you're a smaller church, um, that have the skill sets that you need to do specialized tasks, things in social media or marketing or production or these kinds of things. And so there is a knee-jerk reaction, I think, especially because of COVID, AJ, mm -hmm. where churches are going, oh, we need to hire a marketing person. We need to hire a church communications person. And Unfortunately, especially for churches under 200, they may maybe can only pay someone 15 hours a week or 10 hours a week or something like that. Yeah. And the quality of hire, AJ, that they're going to get is probably not going to be very good. And so um, it is my recommendation that you consider outsourcing sure. that job. So tell me a little bit about, AJ, what does outsourcing look like and and how is that different from hiring? Yeah, well, there's there's a lot of benefits to outsourcing. First of all, you don't have to have somebody local. I mean, we've got technology has opened up the world of outsourcing to the ends of the earth. So literally, yeah. so your pool of talent is nearly infinite. Um, and whereas opposed to, you know, like, hey, do you know anybody that does bookkeeping? We're looking for somebody. It's only about five hours a week you know, they, to come up here to the church. Well, okay. Yeah. So who do we know that lives, you know, within 15 minutes of the church that wants to work five willing, hours a week? Yeah. Who's willing to get paid pennies on the dollar? Right. Right. Yeah. So, um, so it opens up your pool of applicants exponentially. Yeah. Um, it opens up the talent pool exponentially. Um, right. from a financial perspective, it can be it can be very simple, um, and I mean one of the points that you've got in the article too, Scott, is uh, is about you know the cost of benefits or other other things that might have to be paid. Taxes. Where outsourcing yeah. is a huge benefit there as well. So mm -hmm. I think outsourcing is is really great, and you know especially for these niche things, and it, and it right. might be an ongoing task or it might be maybe a contract thing for a certain season or you know maybe just I don't know 
leading up to, you know, Christmas or something. We just need somebody to help us with this or that or before Easter or before VBS. So it right. gives you this flexibility. Um, right. Yeah, there's there's a lot of benefits to outsourcing. Hey, you look at something like, and I, and I, we don't have a relationship with them, at least at the time of this recording, we don't. Uh, give us a contact if you want, if we want to work together. But uh, like something like Church Media Squad, right? You know, you're going to pay... I don't know what their pricing is. And again, I don't know what you're when you're listening to this, but let's just say you're paying $750 a month to church media squad. So that's not a small amount of money. Okay. But, and again, don't hold me to this pricing. I'm just throwing numbers out there, but let's say they'll do an unlimited number of graphics for you. Um, you know, and their turnaround time is, you know, one to two days and they'll do unlimited revisions or whatever. Like, the quality of designer that you're going to get through working with a company like that, that you can cancel at any time if things go south, is you, the quality you're going to get is much higher than if you were to say, I want to find someone, you couldn't even say $750 a month because you're going to have to pay payroll taxes and you're going to have to deal with all kinds of other HR stuff. So you're really looking at someone you can pay $500 a month um, because of all the other overhead you're going to have to carry that you mm -hmm. can't fire easily. Yeah. Um, consider outsourcing. I think a lot of churches right now are thinking, oh, we got to hire this. We got to hire that. It's just hold your breath for a minute. Run it through these principles. Mm -hmm. Someone who does graphics for you is not shaping the strategy, really, mm -hmm. the ministry strategy. They're just executing. Um, they're, they're not safeguarding theology. They're not. They're, they are making what you say should be in a graphic, right? Yeah. You know, um, I, another feature I think of outsourcing, I don't think you mentioned this in the article, Scott, but is upping your level of excellence, mm -hmm. you know, for not much money. And even, even organ companies like Fiverr, you know, where you could have somebody do yeah. a graphic for you, maybe for your next sermon series, put together a package of graphics, or even for, you know, this Sunday's sermon, whatever featured image you're going to use um, to open your sermon, you know, you can get these things done for literally $5. Um, but even if, you, you know, they did a, a PowerPoint, um, you know, overlay package for you for 80 bucks or something that you would use for a few weeks in a sermon series that you just don't have the time, the expertise yourself to do it or mm -hmm. a volunteer right now to do it. You can get professional work for specific niche things and up the excellence level of your church graphically or sound wise or video wise, any of these special technical things that uh, yeah. frequently end up, uh, maybe we feel like, well, we're not ready to hire somebody to do that. Yeah. Um, but if it requires anything technical that could be done by somebody remotely, you can probably get it done cheap and be looking like a hero. Yeah, absolutely. So, I, and I think this is the one, these are the things that churches are asking about right now. Like, yeah. Gosh, do we need to hire this? And my my general response general response to that is, no, don't. You're, you're unless you have a really huge budget, it's not likely you're going to get great value out of that at what you can afford. Yeah. So when you're for hiring for a hire, mm -hmm. you you should consider outsourcing. You're going to get a better. You're going to get more bang for your buck whether that be through Fiverr, which is, you know, you can't guarantee their result on that, you know, or if you start a relationship with something like Church Media Squad where, where they're going to keep revising things until you're happy with it. It's going to cost you more money, but, you know, they're going to keep working on it until you're satisfied. So, um, and I'm just mentioning them. There are other companies that are like them. Just search for them. You'll find them. Um, and then uh, the other alternative, AJ, is just put it off for now. I think yeah. there is ministry envy is real. I think some that's another COVID um, side effect is that churches are looking around going, oh man, this church is doing really great. And, and not even just big churches. You're looking at the same size church as you down the street, who's doing a really good job at XYZ. And, you know, maybe they have more resources than you, or they they just had more of a head start. And it can feel really overwhelming. And you feel like, wow, we've really got to up our, we got to do Instagram and, and, and this and that. And the, and the reality is no. Pick a few things you're going to do them, do them do them really well, and don't worry about the rest. When you have more resources or you have more volunteers who are qualified and can take on more things, then do it. Um, but don't feel like you have to do all the things. I, I just don't think that that's important. What do you think, AJ? Yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, I mean, something I also just thought of is 
this, if there's a, a church similar size to you and you're seeing things out of them that are pretty amazing, it could be that they didn't hire somebody, they're outsourcing it. So they're probably, so, out, they're probably outsourcing it. Maybe yeah. here. And so here's an, another way of knowing, maybe have a relationship with them. Maybe get to yeah. know that and you can like, have, Hey, I love what you guys are doing online. Like, yeah. How did are you guys you hire somebody? That? And they're like, uh, no, we're spending 40 bucks a month. You know, this person's doing this. So, uh, but back to the original point though. Yeah. Um, maybe it's just not the right time for you to do something and, and you don't need to try to bring everything onto your plate all at the same time. You know, I mean, let's let's not forget also just what we're here to do. Let's not lose sight of yep. of the main thing. Uh, and that's to make and mature disciples of Jesus. So stay on mission first. The details, you know, in, in the 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 features can come later. Um, and just make sure you you don't uh, lose focus of what's most important. Um, and I'm not saying to yeah forego excellence uh do everything with excellence but keep the main thing the main thing and if maybe it's just not the right time for you to to do this next hire or, or to expand your ministry right now maybe you just need to focus on some others maybe get some fundamentals um really performing well first so this is the this to hire or not to hire this is the question right so just leverage those three principles when you go man is this something we should hire out ask yourself does it involve shaping the strategy for a ministry? If the answer to that is no, that's your first clue. Probably not something we need to hire out. Number two, uh, is this some, this is this a position that is shaping or safeguarding the theology for a particular ministry or area? If the answer to that is no, then it's probably not something that needs to be done by a staff person. And the third question, are they managing, actively managing large amounts of money through a budget or shaping a budget or forming a budget? If the answer to that is no, then it's probably not a staff position. And certainly, if you hit all three, you get no's, then definitely it should be done by, by a volunteer. But don't forget your sort of side door option of outsourcing when you have specialized skills that you need done that you don't have the volunteers to do it um, and uh, you don't have the skill set on hand. There's no shame in asking for some help and getting someone to help you. And generally speaking, you're going to get a better bang for your buck. Yeah. Great topic, Scott. Thanks so much. Hey, everybody, don't forget to get on over to firstimpressionsconference.com and use the promo code MALFERS for $10 off. Uh, a lot of the things that we talked about today are uh, go w would be an outward facing example in your church. And so uh, you might need to brush up on some first impression skills. That's going to be a great place to do it. And that online conference is going to be November 4th through the 6th. If the you, world is not on fire November <laughs> after 4th. the election, yeah, maybe <laughs> you'll just need some relief from media and you can just say, you know what? Forget it. I'm just going to focus on first impressions That's in my right. church for the next three days. And next week, I'll worry about who our president becomes. The world may be on fire, but at least you will have saved $10. <laughs> by using promo code MALFERS, M-A-L-P-H-U-R-S. <laughs> well, this has been episode 59 of the Church Revitalization Podcast. You can read this week's article at malfersgroup.com slash 59, just the numbers 5-9. And we will be back with you again next week with some fresh new content. Thanks for being with us. We love you guys, and we're praying for your church. See you next week. Bye.